is out of 1 Samuel chapter 2, starting at verse 12. Now the sons of Eli were worthless men. They did not know the Lord. The custom of the priests with the people was that when any man offered sacrifice, the priest's servant would come while the meat was boiling with a three-pronged fork in his hand, and he would thrust it into the pan or kettle or cauldron or pot. All that the fork brought up, the priest would take for himself. This is what they did at Shiloh to all the Israelites who came there. Moreover, before the fat was burned, the priest's servant would come and say to the man who was sacrificing, give meat to the priest for it to roast, for he will not accept boiled meat from you, but only raw. And if the man said to him, let them burn the fat first, and then take as much as you wish, he would say, no, you must give it now, and if not, I will take it by force. Thus the sin of the young men was very great in the sight of the Lord. For the men treated the offering of the Lord with contempt. Samuel was ministering before the Lord, a boy clothed with linen ephod, and his mother used to make for him a little robe and take it to him each year when she went up with her husband to offer the yearly sacrifice. And Eli would bless Elkanah and his wife and say, May the Lord give you children by this woman for the petition she asked of the Lord. So then they would return home to their home. Excuse me. Indeed, the Lord visited Hannah, and she conceived and bore three sons and two daughters. And the boy Samuel grew in the presence of the Lord. Now Eli was very old, and he kept hearing that all his sons were doing <coughs> to all Israel, and how they lay with the women who were serving at the entrance to the tent of meeting. He said to them, Why do you do such things? For I hear of your evil dealings from all these people. Know, my sons, it is no good report that I hear <clears throat> the people of God spreading abroad. If someone sins against a man, God will mediate, <coughs> mediate for him. But if someone sins against the Lord, who can intercede for him? But they would not listen to the voice of their father, for it was the will of God, the will of the Lord, to put them to death. Now the boy Samuel continued to grow in stature and in favor with the Lord, and also with man. And there came a man of God to Eli and said to him, Thus says the Lord, did I indeed reveal myself to the house of your father when they were in Egypt, subject to the house of Pharaoh? Did I choose out of all the tribes of Israel to be my priest, to go up to my altar to burn incense, to wear an ephod before me? I gave to the house of your father all my offerings by fire from the people of Israel. Why then do you scorn my sacrifices and my offerings? that I commanded for my dwelling and honor your sons above me by fattening yourselves on the choicest part of every offering of my people Israel. Therefore, the Lord, the God of Israel declares, I promised that your house and the house of your father should go in and out before me forever. But now the Lord declares, far be it from me, for those who honor me, I will honor, and those who despise me shall be lightly esteemed. Behold, the days are coming when I will cut off your strength and the strength of your father's house, <clears throat> so that there will not be an old man in your house. Then in distress, you will look with envious eye on all the prosperity that I shall bestow on Israel, and there shall not be an old man in your house forever. The only one of you whom I shall not cut off from my altar shall be spared to weep his eyes out, to grieve his heart, and all the descendants of your house shall die by the sword of men. And this <clears throat> that shall come upon your two sons, 
Hophni and Phinehas shall be assigned to you. Both of them shall die the same day. And I will raise up for myself a faithful priest who shall do according to what is in my heart and in my mind. And I will build him a sure house. He shall go in and out before my anointed forever. And everyone who is left in your house shall come to implore him for a piece of silver or a loaf of bread and shall say, please put me in one of the priest's places that I may eat a morsel of bread. Bless his name. Heavenly Father, may your anointing of heaven rest upon this dear pastor as he presents himself before you in this congregation, that your name would be high and lifted up. In your name, Jesus, we are expectant and rejoice. And God's people said, talking about Hannah's song and and how people respond in song and sometimes the electric uh, music can almost if I'm not listening hard whether we're intentionally allowing our voices to be buried because we don't want to have people hear us we, we can hide a little behind the, the boom of the electronic music and drums and everything from the stage it's a little harder to hide the voices it's actually pleasant to hear just the voices of a congregation singing to the Lord this morning. So that was actually a nice way to start. Maybe it's because maybe God, we preached that and went through that passage of Hannah last week. And now this morning we get to put some of it into practice. Maybe that's his timing and not mine. Amen. But this also is the fifth Sunday. So with or without power, we would have had family style service. So it seems apt that we would be talking about two worthless kids. <laughs> But one faithful child, Samuel, as well. Amen. Two worthless, one faithful. And we begin to see that, that contrast that we're going to go through today. In fact, the passage began, Elkanah went home to Ramah. For those who haven't been with us, we spent the first few weeks looking not at, not at Samuel himself, after which the book is named, but we actually looked at his mother Hannah and her faithful earnestness in prayer fact that she then promised to devote her first child, if God gave her a child, to the Lord. So Samuel's been commissioned in the service as a young man growing up there, practicing at the temple. And so mom, we saw, brings him, mom brings him a robe and like makes him in the annual trip. Mom still loves and cares. And we see a child being raised by loving parents, Hannah and Elkanah. And then we also see what has become of the parenting and upbringing that Eli has brought to his own sons and some contrasts there. And that is the heavy word we have. And I want to start, before we get to the actions of these men, we hit the very first verse describing them, and it says, Now the sons of Eli were worthless men. And before we get to any of the actions, Scripture clarifies very specifically why that is. Scripture says, now the sons of Eli were worthless men. They did not know God. Amen. We can go on to how that lived its way out, but honestly, that is sufficient. And that's a hard thing to say today. That's not a very great thing to hear. That's not usually what I lead with when I'm speaking with someone who is indifferent or opposed to the God of this Bible. These are worthless men. Why? They did not know God. In fact, we went through, I went through some verses this week. Just What else does the Bible say about how and why we are worthless in Scripture? I wanted to make myself feel happy. 2 Samuel, 2 Samuel, the second half of this writing about 
Samuel and the king says, Worthless men are like thorns that are thrown away, but they cannot be taken with the hand. Yeah. Proverbs 6 says, A worthless person, a wicked man, goes about with crooked speech. He winks his eyes. He's got that smarmy, sarcastic edge. He signals with his feet, points with his finger. Proverbs 16 says, A worthless man plots evil, and his speech, very apt to our recent spate of incidents in eastern Washington, his speech is like scorching fire. And James says, in the book of James, it says, If anyone thinks his religious life, his religion, if he has that but does not bridle his tongue and deceives his heart, this person's religion is worthless. And Romans, of course, would say about all of us at some point in our lives, none is righteous, no, not one, no one understands, no one seeks God. All have turned aside, together they have become worthless. Worthless men have no inheritance with God's people. In fact, also, there's a character in, in, in the Old Testament so the worthless man whose name was Sheba, the son of Bishri, a Benjamite, he blew his trumpet and said, We have no portion in David, and we have no inheritance in the son of Jesse. Every man to his tents, O Israel. We have a man who says, I have no portion with David, King David. I have no inheritance with those Israelites. Guess what? Granted, you have no inheritance with God's people. They're like thorns, speech like scorching fire. Our religion, if we have been practicing any, is rendered worthless. We do not seek after God. In fact, then Jesus in Matthew says people will come before him and protest, God, we did all these things in your name. And guess which word turns up? Jesus says. It's always like, I know sometimes you read the Old Testament, you're like, well, what if this applies? How does this tie back to Jesus? Jesus talks about worthless too. He says, cast the worthless servant into the outer darkness. In that place there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. We see two worthless men put to death today in this scripture. Jesus says that that death is not just snuffing out, but a place of weeping and eternal gnashing of teeth. So we'll get to the actions of these men in just a minute, but I want you guys, we, if we walk away with anything, we don't need to get to the what wrong things were they doing. I'll make sure I don't stick a fork in other people's meat. Right? We, I don't take, we can get to bad actions later, but the scripture is very clear in its beginning that our worth is determined by where we've placed our identity. <coughs> by that, are we identified with this God? Do we love God? Do we seek after God? Apart from that, Scripture says, I am worthless. The manifest worthless actions I might then express are secondary. Not unimportant, yeah. but secondary. Actions matter. Yeah. Because I can also profess, but my actions or inaction professes otherwise, right? Yeah. So my actions matter. But first we begin with where is that relationship and identity placed? If I don't know who has made me and and how, what the definition of who I am is, I'm worthless. It's like a computer without an operating system. It's just sitting there. Maybe it tries to do all sorts of things. It doesn't have its programming. It doesn't have, it doesn't know where it's from. It doesn't know where it ought to be going. Now these men in their actions, they, did, they wanted what? We see a couple of things. We see they wanted more than their portion. They're practicing. You guys ever heard the thing where the guy has all of his money? He draws a big circle, and he's like, I threw it up in the air, and what goes outside the circle, I, I keep, and what goes inside the circle, we, I give to God. And of course, then he throws it nice and wide. Yeah. <laughs> right here, you've got the men bringing their, their bring, we've got Israelites bringing their offerings, bringing their sacrifices before God, and these men are t sticking a fork in and taking away from portions that do not belong to them. All the pork brought up, the priest would take for himself. Like, oh, just, all right, I'm just going to take my portion. Yeah. Whoops! I guess uh, that, 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 that tiny little rem, the broth is for God, right? I mean, yeah. that's what we have happening. So they want more than their portion, which is something that many of us can say. And somebody's like, well, I'm not a priest, I'm not dealing with people's sacrifices, uh, you know, I'm not in full-time ministry like these guys, whatever. I, we're not. We're talking about people who take more than their portion. So this is not apart from any of us thinking about how we can sin. But they also 
also then said they were then going out of order. They'd go before the fat was even burned. They're, 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 if they have any portion or gleaning from this, it was not supposed to be done before it was burned. They go, no, 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 I want it raw. I want to cook it myself. Or maybe they liked it raw. I don't know. Give meat for me. I don't want to know. Don't burn it first. Don't follow the process. Just I want it now. And if not, I'll take it by what? Force. You basically have people bringing offerings to God, and they're beating them up like the kid who beats up people for their lunch money. You give me my portion, and I want my portion before God's portion. I want my portion first. No, I know you brought it for God. No, give me the raw stuff before you do anything with it. I want my portion before God's portion. And some of us face elements of that as well. We receive a lot of things from God. What do we think about what we get? Which order do we approach it? Do we give God our leftovers? And do we take what we want first? If there's anything left, maybe that goes to God. It's, 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 it's still in the circle. It's outside the circle. They wanted more than their portion. And they wanted their portion first before God got anything. But scripture comes in here. Let's, we think that we're just talking about worthless kids. And all the kids are like, is there nothing in here that's aspiring for me? <laughs> Samuel was ministering before the Lord. Amen. And we see from that, his mother and father are also honored. And blessed. Not only did God respond to Hannah's gift or her, her prayers, her fervent prayers for more for a child, she then receives multiple children yes. from the Lord. Samuel is ministering before the Lord. We have this contrast right there. The, the boys or the men who look like they should be in the lineage of being the good kids and being the blessing and being the sons. Of the, high, of the high priest. Here instead we have this boy who doesn't specifically belong by blood, but there he is in the same place, actually being the faithful child. Yes. And you know, I, I'm not an Israelite. I'm a Gentile, as scripture would say. I am other. We have this idea of someone is being actually grafted in to take that place, because honestly, those who are technically in the bloodline here are worthless. And we see a family, not just the boy Samuel, but again the family. We see again the devoted Hannah. This isn't just Samuel's story. This is God's story. And in it we see godly characters and characters who oppose God. But in that we see Samuel and Samuel's family being faithful. They're visiting. She brings them a robe. She brings her child gifts. She's very caring and loving. And they're faithful and they're having more children. Boy Samuel grew in the presence of the Lord. Eli's sons then are perverse. Scripture goes on to talk about more of that. Dad has to confront his boys, something he probably should have done much sooner, something he probably should have preempted when they've obviously been doing this practice for quite some time, not even just taking more than their portion, but then being inappropriate. They're perverse in disdain for God's marital order. Things are happening with women right in front of the temple. Basically forms of prostitution. And Eli says, what are you doing? You're not only profaning people and hurting people who brought their offerings to God. But then he actually says something which we'll come back to. He says, if someone sins against a man, God will mediate for him. But if someone sins against the Lord, who can intercede for him? We'll come back to that. Now, some of you may not, may, some of you are not maybe doing some of these things in a perverse way. But God, since the beginning of creation, designed a beautiful relationship between man and woman that has an order and a way of coming together and a covenant relationship. There are many ways to profane that. They're choosing one of many. And so again, this isn't outside of our temptations to go outside of God's design. Eli's sons are perverse, but it says they would not listen to the voice of their father. Would not listen. And we have 
this contrast I want you guys to hear at our men's morning prayer on Tuesday. A few of the guys were asking about it as we hit some Proverbs. It said they would not listen to their father, for it was the will of the Lord to put them to death. We have what Scripture gives, which is a tough tension between God's sovereignty and with the verses we have that say he both knows all and is predestined to the events that take place. And then where does human choice and will come into the equation? And here we see a marriage in Scripture with maybe not an exact scientific answer that makes us really feel like we've got it, but we see both at hand. It was the will of the Lord to take these adult, sinful sons and put them to death. They refused to listen to the voice of their father who was warning them. They're choosing... If God is sovereignly doing anything, he's not breaking through. Could and does God have the power? Could he bro break any spirit in this room and bring someone to their knees? Could his spirit break through hardness of heart and open eyes? Absolutely. But does God have obligation to do that? No. And in this play, in this time, in this choice, does he choose to break through and reach in miraculously and change those sons' hearts and spirits and crush them and bring them to repentance. No, he lets them go about in their chosen way. Their chosen way. And again, then we come back, it says the boy Samuel continued to grow both in stature and in favor with the Lord and man. Now, people who've often heard the story of Jesus, does that sound a little bit familiar? Here we see a foreshadowing in the boy Samuel a man will be used of God, while not the Son of God sent into the world like Jesus. But we have that same thing about the upbringing. A child who is growing both in stature and in favor with the Lord and man. Even Jesus in his incarnation grows in that way. Grows just like any other boy. And God continues to demonstrate the sharp contrast in, this, in these children. And finally then the man shows up, a man of God who we don't know who this is, shows up and tells Eli that his household is done. Done. That's a hard word. I, I can't sugarcoat that. I can't find the pun in here. There's nothing as a pastor I can do to have someone show up and tell a man, your household is done. It's cut off. There'll be no, there'll be no more old men in your house. Your line is done because of your sinfulness. That's a heavy, I imagine this is heavy for Eli to hear. But at the same time, we see Eli warn his boys. We see Eli looking as though he's actually saying and speaking out of what God would have him do. But there is a little implication in the verse that Eli has not been as faithful as he ought to have been either. Why then do you scorn my sacrifices, God says to him, and my offerings that I commanded for my dwelling, and honor your sons above me by fattening yourselves? Who's receiving a portion of that meat they're taking to? Eli. And the choicest parts of every offering of my people, Israel. Eli's household is done. The expositor's Bible commentary I was reading this week, prepping for this message, had a couple things to say, which sound very harsh, but maybe we need to hear them this week. As, as a community, we got to, I got to got to take our God kids for the day. For our couple kids that, that we love. We had Nerf War with them yesterday. We took them to see Sean the Sheep, and we got to spend time with kids. And all of us, whether it's kids' ministry time on other Sundays, as we raise our kids, not just as the parents over those kids, but in Christian community together, it's also important that we have a right perspective of our love of God and why we love those kids. Because as the expositor says in the commentary, Eli has demonstrated that he loves his sons more than he loves God. And he's unworthy of the Lord's blessing. <clears throat> Eli had honored his sons more than he honored God. What do we cherish more than God? Now for some of us, this doesn't have to be our children. Hopefully you cherish your children. Hopefully you cherish them because they were gifts from God, and out of that love of God, you express his love to them. And it has a proper rhythm, and it has a proper order. But what do we cherish then, if not our kids? What tempts us to cherish it more than God? Something that might not be a bad thing. 
our children so that they would be involved in wickedness or sin and we wouldn't tell them what, we wouldn't talk to them about God's heart for those things because what do we cherish more than God? This, could, this may not be children, this could be spouse. This could be our home or our property or our securities. This could be our vices, whatever they may be. Ones that can have a really adverse effect on your health like smoking or, or maybe just some that aren't, don't have imminent, but they take your eyes and your distractions and you're basically addicted. Is it just our recreation that we cherish more than God? For some of us, that's probably true. What takes more of my heart and my time and my thoughts and my cravings? Is it that vacation? Is it that sports team? What, what consumes me in the way that obviously that I would put lesser the things of God or speaking the truths of God as Eli has done and not speaking as he ought to and dealing with his sons as he ought to? Deuteronomy 6 says, You shall love your Lord your God with all your heart, all your soul, all your mind. And out of that, like, okay, what room is there left for my children? It says, And these words that I command you today shall be on your heart. You shall teach God's word to your children and shall talk to them when you sit in your house, when you walk by the way, and when you lie down, and when you rise. The best way that we love God and love our children is because we love them by communicating the truths of God. Out of that love for God, it pours out to those children. They see our love for God, not even just in the words we say, but where our hearts and affections are. Maybe sometimes even what we don't say speaks more loudly to our kids or to those we're discipling in our lives than what we do say. Teach them diligently to your children. That leaves us with some questions to work through. That leaves all of us with some things we can encounter today and at least challenge maybe our where we're sitting right now versus where we ought to be. What do we have in our lives out of order? If not like those wicked sons of Eli, what is it in my life? How is my life organized in such a way that God gets my leftovers? What or whom am I putting first? It doesn't have to be our children. I think more often than not, at least my default, it's just myself. What or whom am I putting first? Ourselves. Or our self-defined identity. Again, apart from being a child of God, apart from a relationship with the one true and only God, God says James is Apart from being reconciled in relationship, knowing and seeking after, knowing who my Father in Heaven is and how He has provided for me, apart from that, God would declare James worthless. Because I could probably spend a lot of my time not seeking after God and seeking after my own identity. Is our quest for our identity, am I consumed with my own identity or being ruled by God's identity. Loving our children is loving God with our all when it recognizes them as gifts from God. You guys know your gift, right? <laughs> Are you guys gifts from God? She's like, yeah. <laughs> Loving our children is loving God with our all when we give them God's unfiltered truth. And loving our children is loving God when they see that we value Him the most. I'm going to tell you a story. Some of you might not like it. As a child, it was very profound to me. Because as I read Scripture, I saw that there was this beautiful first relationship between a man and a woman. God brought together Adam and Eve, God brought together men and women throughout Scripture, and they would become husband and wife. And they would covenant with each other. And as a kid, I even learned that that was representative and a picture of Jesus and his church. That actually marriage, even though it comes before Jesus came a couple thousand years ago, was from creation set up to be a foreshadowing and a little bit of a portrait of this relationship of Christ and his people, his bride, corporately. 
way that we are as the church. And so I knew that that relationship was of utmost importance, and that then God, out of that relationship, by his discretion, like to Hannah, he gives children. And one time I was having a conversation with my dad, and he was telling me a story, and he said, you know what? And I was old enough to understand this gravity. He said, if there was a car accident, if there was a flood, if I, if I had to go out and rescue, if you, if you and mom and your brother were out here on a little island and I had to swim out and rescue you one at a time, he's like, you know what? I covenanted before God that this woman I would love as my own flesh. I'm going. I would go out and I would bring your mother to safety first, but I would come back to you. I understood at an early age, oh, my dad's first affection in an earthly realm was that he covenanted to his wife, my mom, and he loved her and would lay his life down for her like Jesus laid it down for the church. And that didn't lessen his love for me. It just told me there was a love that was preeminent. And in the same way, our love for God is to be preeminent over that spouse, over those children. The love and affection for God. Sometimes I wake up every day, I don't see him like I see my wife. I don't see him like I see my friends. He doesn't seem as visible and imminent and apparent. But that's when I need to get on my knees and ask him to help me recognize that. My affection is not normally every morning perfectly attuned to God first. In fact, usually it's not attuned to even wife first. It's James first. But you know what? It's not just a commentator who says that the problem here is that Eli loved his sons and honored his sons more than he loved God and honored God. Shockingly to some of us, there's harsh words that come from the one that we can at least all usually agree on in this room, and that is Jesus Christ in Matthew 10. He says, whoever loves father or mother more than me is not worthy of me. And whoever loves son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. And whoever does not take his cross and follow me is not worthy of me. Whoever finds his life will lose it. And whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. We have a culture that is all about finding and pouring your identity. It's this quest for identity. It's a quest for my life and what's my life about and building my household and my legacy and my family and my this. And it's, it's my sense of identity. It's my life. And what does Jesus say? He says, whoever finds that will lose it. If that's what your quest is, that ends in loss. He says, whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. And then, if we bring this back to Scripture, I quote Jesus because we actually get that last verse that we read in, 2 Samuel, in 1 Samuel 2. We actually see Jesus is spoken of, though the author doesn't realize that. It says, I'll raise up for myself a faithful priest who shall do according to what is in my heart and in my mind. Now, some of you could be thinking, well, of course, Samuel's being groomed for that right now. And in one portion, it's true. This is speaking in one small sense about Samuel, and the story will continue in the weeks to come. But it also says, and I will build him a sure house, and he, this priest, shall go in and out before my anointed forever. Now, Samuel... He actually has a good run, but he passes away. God promises here that there will be a faithful priest that is risen up, that will oversee and be the intermediary forever between God's people and God. And so we come back to Eli's query. We come back to Eli's query and cry as he's trying to warn those sons. He says, if someone sins against a man, God will mediate for him. But if someone sins against the Lord, who can intercede? Who can intercede? So in one sense, we do see, as this book goes on, as the book of Samuel continues, we see a priest, Samuel, who then... 
ushers in the age of kings, first Saul, but then David, the king after God's own heart. And so we see a priest and a king, and we see prophet, priest, and king, but all of these things are lived out and pointing toward the answer to Eli's question. Because we see in this muddled passage right here a hint of what will get clarified in the book of Hebrews. When it says, since then we have a great high priest who has passed through the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold fast our confession. For we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weaknesses, but one who has been every respect been tempted as we are, yet without sin. For every high priest is appointed to act on behalf of men in relation to God, to offer gifts and sacrifices, but Jesus has gone as a forerunner on our behalf, having become a high priest forever, Hebrews said. Who is our priest forever? The Eli is crying out, saying, Who can mediate between us and God? Who can mend that relationship when we've sinned against a holy and righteous God? That is Jesus, who, unlike us, has not sinned. He did not walk this life and take more than his portion. As a priest, he does not stick a fork in it and take away. In fact, he doesn't even need us to bring offerings. He becomes the offering. He becomes the atonement. For our sin. 1 Peter 2 9 says that we're a royal priesthood. If you guys were listening to the very end, the oracle against Eli and his household, it not only said there'd be a high priest forever, but then it, what did it say? It said, and your household, the unworthy household, will come and ask this high priest who is a high priest forever. It says, you'll come to him and say, please put me in one of the priest's places that I may eat a morsel of bread. Listen to 1 Peter 2.9. But you are a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for his own possession, that you may proclaim the excellencies of God who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. All of us who come before that high priest who has been anointed forever, the Son of God, Jesus Christ, all of us come before him and we say, can I be a priest? Can I have a morsel of bread? And he says, yes, you're adopted into God's family. You are a priesthood of believers. All of us, brothers and sisters of Christ, are saints and priests in the house of God. That's why when I say, give us this day our daily bread, even the Lord's Prayer ties in to this oracle of Eli. We become God's priests. Our provision comes from God. And so the question today is, we, as we close, are we raising our children like Eli? Are we raising them like Elkanah and Hannah were? Devoting these children to God. Dedicating these children to God. Treating and bringing them into the family of God and letting them see that family. Because like the kids here today, they need to know they're part of a special family. You guys need to know you're part of a special family. They need to know you have brothers and sisters outside of the way our culture or blood would simply define it. When we come together as the church, our little children are saying, Oh, I have brothers and sisters in addition to my brothers or sisters. Nobody in the kingdom of God is an only child. A house full of only sisters has brothers in Christ. A house with just brothers has some sisters in Christ. And that's why on many Sundays we teach them those things. We teach them to sing. We teach them to respond. In fact, if we'd had power in all of our processes, we were going to have the kids sing a song. We'll save that for next time. But last week we even talked about song, and the question is, are we humble enough to express ourselves, or even sometimes, whether it's the songs that we sing in church today, or whether it's songs with our kids where we then have to sing a little bit more like little kids, are we humble enough to express ourselves and sing in such a way to show them that we exalt our Savior? We're going to have an opportunity to do that, and they're with us today. So if we don't know the words exactly and we struggle like little kids to sing along, that's okay. We don't have power. So now like kids trying to remember the lyrics, if we heard them last week or if we heard them sometime, we're going to struggle to sing together. Let's struggle to model a little bit of that. Struggle and model 
what Elkanah and Hannah did in their very fervent way of dedicating Samuel. We're not bringing our kids for temple service, but we do bring them gathered together under a roof as the house and family of God. And hopefully, like Samuel saw the faithfulness of his mom and dad, we can see the faithfulness of one another. Our kids can see our faithfulness. Or maybe some of us who just need that faith renewed like little children can see the rest of us and be restored in that. So let's work to do that today. Let's labor to find and express the joy that God has promised to us. And I will pray. Father, we thank you so much that you paint for us not just a portrait of wicked children, but a portrait of a mom and dad struggling earnestly to love and lead, and then the response of a child growing up in wisdom and favor with God and man. And so help us, God, where maybe some of us, like the adult sons of Eli, are caught in our hearts and or in our actions, in the wrong pursuits, in the wrong sins, that we are seeking self instead of seeking you, that we are seeking our satisfaction in other things and earthly things, even things that take or hurt from others, or maybe just profane or distract from you. God, help us to walk away from those things and become not like those adult sons, but adults who are leading future sons and daughters of Christ into a right walk and a right path. Let that correct the actions of our hands and the components of our speech and the components and intricacies of our heart. As we see, yes, you are sovereign, and yes, you are a destiny in God, but yet we see that our choices matter. And help us to choose you in your name. Amen. Amen.